Today, by the grace of the living God, we will continue with part two of our series titled, The Dispositions of Real Men. Say that to your neighbor. I didn't say whisper. Say to your neighbor, the dispositions of real men. Paul looked at the Corinthian church and said, you are carnal, you are behaving like babes, and you are behaving like mere men. And so for a while now, since April, we have been looking at the subject, we are not mere men, we are real men. Men that God, God can count upon, men will not take advantage of the gullible, men will not exploit the vulnerable, men will stand in the place, not just of intercession, but intervention in the lives and affairs of people. After my virtual meeting with the Citadel Global Community Church Diaspora Family Fellowship on Saturday, June 29, 2024, it was crystal clear to me that I would need to get back to the church to redo this same teaching all over again. If you can recall that day, I came in a simple shirt and just jeans or something, and I just touched all the points, one, two, three, four, five, and I said, one day we'll come back and I'll do the sixth one, what it means to be a gentleman. Real men are gentlemen. But after I sat back and taught for one and a half hours, and I only mentioned one point out of six, I felt I'll be shortchanging you. I need to get back to really teach the dispositions of real men. This repetition is not because there was any error in part one of this message that I preached here, as I said, on the night of June 2024. It is because that message was not as full as the one received by the CGCC Diaspora Family Fellowship. For example, like I said, the first point of the dispositions of real men that I taught here on the night of June was the only point that I taught those in the diaspora for over one hour. So if I taught one point out of six for over one hour, I wasn't just making noise. I was teaching them truth, line upon line, Line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, a little here and a little there. Amen? Amen. This may take several Sundays before we finish. Is that okay by you? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, you have stuck with me for all the Sundays of July. All. Oh, ain't going nowhere. Uh -huh. What was to take me out of here today? I was supposed to fly out of the country today. But God, in his mercies, had kind of postponed that or pushed it forward for another time. So Sunday the 7th, the 14th, the 21th, the 28th, you and I are stuck together. I didn't hear you say amen. amen. Take it from me that those in the diaspora, we have to listen also to what you receive today. This, I think, is in line with the apostolic tradition established by Paul. What tradition? Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. Colossians 4, 16. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Do you understand me? So, let the epistle that he was writing to the Colossians, be read by the Laodiceans, and let those in Laodicea read what is coming from Colossia. So let's start with the spiritual diagnosis of the Corinthian church by Apostle Paul before he removed their masks and called them mere men. First Corinthians chapter 1, 1 to 9. What manner of people were this uh, men and women in the church at Corinth. I want you to pay attention that with all the pluses and the positives they heard, if they were called mere men, we have to be careful because I don't think many of our churches today have attained the level they attain. First Corinthians chapter one, verse one to nine. 
Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are, I can't hear you, to those who are sanctified means they are set apart, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, they are not saints yet, but they are called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you are enriched how? Talk to me somebody. You are enriched in what? In everything by him in all utterance. What is utterance? A spirit energized communication that communicates the heart of God to the hearts of men. That you are enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as a testimony of Christ. What is the testimony of Christ? The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Even as his testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that you come short in no gift. All the gifts of the spirit, the nine of them were in manifestation in this church. That you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number nine, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. See how great these people were. Let's now check verse 10 to 17. With all this utterance, with all this knowledge, with all the gifts of the Holy Spirit that they were not behind, in any of them, Paul was now pleading. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. If our value systems are the same, I will not take advantage of you, you will not take advantage of me. Your good money will be good money. When we shake hands, that will be final. Do you understand me? Because you will behave as one who is under the authority of God Almighty to be truthful in all that you do. I asked someone a question yesterday. He gave me one answer. He did not know that I will investigate. By the time I investigated, he lied to me. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are con contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I'm a Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm Severus, that's Peter. I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Sometimes he would not even remember who he baptized, who he did not. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Hello? but to preach the gospel, not to wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, because of divisions and contentions amongst them, see what they became. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. What is carnal? A carnal mind is enmity against God. What is flesh? The flesh is the hidden disposition in us to do evil. Like you carry malaria parasite on the inside of you, and when you stretch yourself too much, bam, it strikes. So, it's a carnal nature, so is the flesh. is a hidden disposition to do evil. 
It'll be watching you like a time bomb. Boom! It explodes on your face. And you say, wow, how did I get here? And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to canal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with... Oh, talk to me, somebody. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. When you read that in the King James Version of the Bible, it's so sweet. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with strong meat. For until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, hello, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? You know, sometimes when I read my Bible, I pause. So I fed you with milk. Do you know many people in the church does not even qualify for milk today? Not to talk of strong meat. When it comes to milk, they do not have what it takes to retain the benefits of the milk they have taken. You won't give a six days old, seven days old, seven uh, weeks old. <laughs> I wanted to say pomo <laughs> or ishairo, you know, strong meat. Uh, those of you uh, went to proper school, you were raised in a Jebota home, uh, you have table manners, you understand me? Your mouth does not make music when you are eating. <laughs> It was Mrs. B who corrected me. He said, why is your mouth making noise when you are eating? I said, because milk, inshallah, they say, I'm not denying what I'm eating. So he said, you're not supposed to eat that way. How am I supposed to eat? He said, okay, put food in your mouth, close your teeth, and then be changed. I said, oh, it's not convenient. <laughs> Have you ever seen any lion with table manners? Pry, <laughs> tears and pieces. And when, when you take the meat, no cutlery. It was 1972, the first ball cutlery for me on my way to boarding school. You put the meat here in between, and it splashes all over, a sign of good living. <laughs> Don't disgrace me outside. So when I go outside and I see the yuppie, the rich, and I say, what are you eating? I say, vegetable and fish. It's not difficult to handle. <laughs> but when I get home with the ah ah, pala, fele gusi, mama, ishaira, bokoto, shaki, kai, 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 kai. You've been making music to God. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see the prescription for milk. That if you qualify to take the milk of the world, these are things that must not be in your life. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. To know that you're not carnal, you're not flesh, fleshly, and you're not just uh, uh, dealing with things you should have outgrown. These are the things that must be evident in your life when you qualify for the milk of the world. Therefore, laying aside what? All malice and what? All deceit and what? Hypocrisy. You know who a hypocrite is? A man who killed both of his parents and is bleeding with the joy to show him mercy because he's an orphan. <laughs> laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the world that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So when you are taking milk, all malice, all envy, all hypocrisy, all evil speaking should not flow from your mouth. That's the standard of the milk. How many of us qualify? Husband and wives who are extreme total strangers, always together forever apart, Intimate strangers. My mother told me one day, Mrs. B and I were having some misunderstanding. I know that you don't have any in your family. Your marriage is perfect, made in heaven. No disagreement, no nothing. We had. And in those days, 
uh, it was time for fellowship. Hmm? And I have a special song. And she had us. My special song. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Family devotion. Let God arise and his enemies and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. The day togu togu. The day tija tija. The day alagbara. The day alarumi. When I get to gear three, you'll be hearing Olori O Gunja Fum you Ja Ja Olori O Gunja Fum you. Oh Lord, you go to phone me. Hey! Oh Lord, you go to phone me. Our own song is soft and nice. You want to hear it? I am married to Jesus, Satan, leave me alone. I am married to Jesus, Satan, leave me alone. My husband is coming to take me away. To everlasting. <laughs> what a devotion. <laughs> My mother, who did not study English language, who had part of the song, said, Ah, I would like to talk to you. <laughs> so I went to Mama. He said, Have you seen sacrifices made and put in public space? Have you seen any devil going there to eat except dogs? He said, because the devil does not live outside. I said, Mama, he said, they put his food outside, but he doesn't live there. It is dogs that will eat those sacrifices that the demon worshippers and idol worshippers put outside. You only find dogs eating it. I said, so where is the devil? I said, I will tell you. It's in your bedroom. The wife sleeps this way and turn to the east. The husband sleeps this way and turn to the west. The gap they created is one night Airbnb for Satan. When you make up, it will go to another house. From that day, I understood what was meant by give no place to the devil. Most of the time, you are where you are because you don't understand the power of agreement. That if two of you shall agree as touching anything on this earth, my Father in heaven. Look at the standard of milk. Shall we go to the standard of strong meat? For many years I taught here day and night. On Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to 14. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. We call it Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Fiesta in those days. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Do you understand I mean, that? We need to take you back to milk to give you a proper orientation of what it means to be able to take milk and to grow thereby. You, you're still a babe. Give it to me in KJV. It will tell you strong meat. How many of you have handled strong meat? Some people handle strong meat, pram. They are two to fall out. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now listen to me. Does it mean that adults don't take milk? Adults take milk, but you take little milk in your coffee. You take little milk in your tea. Or if you're rich, you can put little milk in your gari too. 
a little milk in your ghee. You understand me? And they say, Olo, me muti, mo muka, o mi bona ni bubu ajo mu. You soon find out that one o mi bona is different from the other. Are you with me? So adults still use me, but little quantity. I remember uh, one of my uh, daughters in the faith. Uh, uh, her daughter was permanently on milk. I attended a wedding in California with Mrs. B a few months back. Every time, she was about four, five, or three, four, all she would eat was milk. They would put it in the feeding bottle. Oh, you know who I'm talking about. I went to the camp in those days. I said, bring your daughter and the feeding bottle. Fill out the feeding bottle. So the mother drew up, left her with us at the camp. I gave her the first feeding bottle. <laughs> I washed it and turned it upside down so that she saw that the bottle has finished. I gave the second bottle. <laughs> By the time the sixth bottle was over, I put all the empty bottles. And then he came, I'm hungry. I said, hey, rice, Ray. <laughs> Here is dodo. Here is rice. Here is beans. <laughs> I said, well, I kill a very cool. She cried for hours. She slept. She woke up. She was hungry. Uh, I want to eat. I said, dodo. Ewa. <laughs> rice. Amala. <laughs> it will have <laughs> Then it started with dodo. The mother is watching me now. <laughs> yeah, that we do that. Then they could take one piece of uh, dodo. Then a little rice. Then little meat. By the time she was over, I said, Jamala. <laughs> that was the last time she had me. May God win you of milk. Amen. What is strong meat? Accurate discernment to know what is e good from what is evil. That you will not touch it because you know this is wrong. Give me Hebrews 4. Let's read it again. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again would be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is Hey, babe, isn't that what you call your wife? Babe. <laughs> babe, how are you? I'm fine. Babe. Huh? I'm about to. He is strong. Babe. I was at the camp the other day. I won't tell you which camp. I was greeting a uh, spiritual father and mother there. And she came out, who was with me that day? I think it was Ojo Aromo Kudu that was with me. Or was it you? One of the, was it you? It was him. And he said, ah, mommy, inko. That was the wife asking, ah, mommy, inko. Mommy, chiku. Ha! I said, I wrote a letter here. Are you sent representative? He said, my pamio, I'm talking about your wife. I said, every pamini here. If you're calling my wife my mother, <laughs> oh, mommy, <uncle. laughs> and the rest of you still lie like Abraham. <laughs> don't tell them you are my wife. Or tell everybody you are my sister so that they don't kill me. I want sister, uncle. <laughs> your wife is your wife. Be mature. Call things by their names. Uh, I want sister thank you. Is this your sister? No. She's your wife. Thank you. Is this your sister? You can't say, you can't say otherwise. I joined both of you. <laughs> and I know you are late on your wedding day. Uh -huh. He was there on time. You came late. That's why I gave you family life to go and walk there. So they will not be late again. All right, let me finish reading. <laughs> but strong me belongs to them that are of full age. The New King James Version says, who are mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. The word exercise there is the word discipline to discern both good 
and evil. There are three categories of people, moral, immoral, and amoral. Amoral does not even know what's wrong. They tell lies with relish. It's their second nature. Give me in New King James Version. Let's read that last verse. In New King James Version, thank you. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Give it to me in the New Living Translation. Thank you, quickly. New Living Translation. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Give it to me in the message translation. The message translation. I have a lot more to say about this, but it is hard to get it across to you since you have picked up this bad habit of not listening. But this time you ought to be teachers yourselves. Yet here I find you need someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again, starting from square one, baby's milk, when you should have been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners, inexperienced in God's ways. Solid food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong. The, teenage, the, 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 the passion translation, the passion translation. Am I wasting your time? And you're going to get it from all angles. The Passion Translation. But solid food is for the mature whose spiritual senses perceive heavenly matters. And they have been adequately trained by what they have experienced to emerge with understanding of the difference between what is truly excellent and what is evil and harmful. Now let's amplify it. The Amplified Version. Pay attention. Amplified Version. Amplified version, thank you. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. But solid food is for full grown men. For those whose senses and, men and mental faculties are trained by practice to discriminate and distinguish between what is morally good and noble and what is evil and contrary either to divine or human law. Do you understand this? So if he says you are mere man, you are carnal, you are, I'm still feeding you with milk, you do not qualify for strong meat, you need to rise up and say, Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired of baby food. Walk in me. Do your work, stand to your feet. Do your work sovereignly in me. That I will mature in things of God. I will not be dabbling into things I have no business dabbling with. Lord, I stand before you today that you will do your work sovereign in me for both to will and to do of your good pleasure are in you. This day, Father, in the name of Jesus, we call upon you to grant us grace to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, to put on the whole armor of God as we are able to stand against the walls of the enemy. Thank you, Father, for raising mature men, mature women, Mature boys, mature girls who are wiser than our age in this house. Give us children like Daniel who will be wiser to the power of ten more than all the magicians and astrologers of Egypt, of Babylon. We thank you for answers coming from your presence in Jesus' mighty name. And the people said, Amen. You may be seated. I'll repeat again, what does it mean to be carnal? There's always a carnal believer. There's nothing like that. You don't want to be a carnal believer because carnality is enmity against God. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 to 8. For to be carnally minded is death, separation from the life of God. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You know what that means? They cannot exercise faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay? What is the cure for carnality? If you sit before a doctor, 
of medicine. He knows what to give you for pain. They call it painkillers. If you cough, he knows what to write for you, and so on and so forth. What exactly is a cure for carnality? First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. First Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know anything among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. The cross is a cure for carnality. That's why he keeps on saying, take your cross and follow me. Anytime you get to the crossroad in life, take what up? The cross. I was with you in weakness and fear and in more trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Friends, the Corinthian church was not behind in any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were sound in knowledge and were blessed with profound utterance. But they were at the same time carnal. And because of their spiritual immaturity, Paul described their conduct as that of men. He pointed out their malice, such as envy, strife, and divisions, and that warranted, that warranted his pre prescription of the cross of Christ for their healing and recovery. Who and who then are real men, and by extension, real women? Are you ready? Who and who are real men? Who and who are real women? Point number one, Real men are violent dead men. You remember me mentioning that the first time I taught on this, but you will see the areas I didn't touch. I just glossed over them. Real men and real women are violent dead men. Let me define for you and for your benefit the deadness of real men and their violence in eight very unique Bible-based ways. I want to bring out eight qualities that you can relate with that are the qualities of dead, violent, real people. Eight is the number of new beginning. I trust that as you embrace imbibe, and apply these truths, may they bring for you a new you and a, rad, a new beginning for you in Jesus' name. Point number A, out of the eight things I want to say about violent dead men, only dead men can do ministry. Only dead men can do ministry. This is the summary of what Moses was told when he said to God, please show me your glory. Ah, and God looked at him and said, he want to see my glory? Only dead men can do that. Exodus 33, 12 to 13. Exodus 33, 12 to 23, 12 to 23. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way. That's a prayer he prayed. And that was why God showed his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. They were just saying the acts, they do not know the process. And if there's no process, there cannot be progress. Now, therefore, I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you. That's the first P of the seven pillars of wisdom. 
My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us off from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate and sanctified. We shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Does God know you by name? And he said, this is Moses, please show me your glory. Then he, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. <laughs> Woo! I can close here. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and leave. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. And you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by. That I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand. While I pass by, rock of ages, clap for me. Let me. Yes, Lord. Let the water and the flow. Yes, Lord. From the river side which flow. Yes, rock of ages. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Save me from wrath and temple. Amen. Save me from wrath and make me pure. Rock of ages clear for me. Let me hide myself in you. The rock that never fails. Let me hide in you. <laughs> Let me hide in you. In you there is power. The rock that never fails. Let me hide in you. Let me hide. Let me hide in you. In you there is power. This is the stone that was caught without a human hand. That destroyed all idols, all demons, whether of gold or silver, and filled the entire planet. When you are hidden with Christ in God, anybody that wants to take you out will face God and face Christ before they can get to you. He said, I will pass before you, you will see my behind. But no man that wants to serve me will see my face and leave. You have to be dead to see him. Only dead men do ministry. How do I know that this is real? That only dead men do ministry. In those days, in the days of Christ, the Greek people who were uh, merchants, shipping merchants and magnates that owned their own ships, like later subsequently owners, they were rich men. And they came to Jesus, they came to Jerusalem, and they saw Philip. And they said, Sir, to Philip, this wealthy man, sir, who would like to see Jesus. After they had said their sir to Philip, Philip knew that the main contact to Jesus, like you want to enter my office, you see some people there, they know why they are standing there. They're not harmful to you, they're not wicked. It's because they know certain protocols. But I want you know, Tobaran in Sheru, do you understand? He knew that he could not just walk to Christ. He knew the man who had access. Every time you see Andrew in the Bible, he's always taking people to Jesus. So Andrew and Philip now went to Jesus. Come on. The Greek had come. The rich dudes are here. These are the billionaires of their days. And they said, we would like to see Jesus. Jesus should roll red carpet and say, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Rich men are here, rich men are here, and we... 
Jesus did not leave where he was. He said, go and tell them, except a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It abides alone. Let's start now from verse 24. I want them to read it and understand it. Okay? John 12 from verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Do you know that your connection to Jesus makes people to say sir to you? You disconnect <laughs> and see what happens to you. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus, listen to the master. But Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Do you want your life to produce much fruit? The prescription is death. Next prescription is a cross. Another good example is that of the rich young ruler who ran to Jesus and knelt before him and asked what he must do to inherit eternal life. He thought eternal life is something you do in order to gain. He went away sorrowfully because he was told to sell what he had and to take his cross and follow Jesus. Are you taking your cross on daily basis? God has a way of packaging your cross for you. Things you don't expect will suddenly happen. It becomes your cross. And if you master how to navigate with such situation, you've learned another thing called process. Mark chapter 10, 17 to 31. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Is Jesus saying he's not good? No. He's saying, do you recognize me as God? Because no one is good except God. You know the commandments? Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not be a false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. No wonder I was wealthy. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. How many things? One. One thing you lack. You don't own money. Money owns you. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Uh-huh. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for great possessions had him. That should be the, the literal translation of that. For he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, wait for this, please understand. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Ah, And the disciples were astonished at his words. Why? Because they wanted to be rich also. Why are we following you? You know, it's so stupid to come to church and be looking for gold, silver, and riches. God said to Solomon, in that you did not ask me for wealth. You did not ask me for the death of your enemies. You didn't even ask me for long life. I will give you wisdom that you asked for, and I will add this unto you. Many people run after fringe benefits. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches. That's the issue. The rich young ruler was trusting in his riches. How hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Isn't that impossible? You know how tiny the eye of the needle is? Jesus said, it would be a lot easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Trust Peter. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? 
Can I ask a simple question? Say yes. You want me? No man can serve two masters. You either hate one and, be, and love the other, or you'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. How many of you are serving God? So you hate money? Huh? Edamilomu. Please answer me. How many of you are serving mammon? Majority of you. And what it means to serve mammon is the next verse after Matthew 6 24. Take no thought. What we shall eat, what we shall drink, and the clothes we shall. The moment you are worried and you have anxiety about food, about fashion, about future, you are a mammon worshiper. So this man, this rich young ruler that came, was possessed by the things he thought he possessed. Verse 26. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Listen to Jesus. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Then Peter began. He didn't say Peter said. Then Peter began to say to him, which means he laid the foundation. He progressed in his thoughts as he was presenting it and said, see, we have left all and followed you. Ah, Peter, you are one lay. Peter, your boat is still alive sailing because he went back to eat on the Sea of Tiberias. He said, I go out fishing. We have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, As surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold. No bank can pay you that. A hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and the age to come, eternal life. I love this. And many who are first will be last and the last first. It is on record that the first set of missionaries that came from Europe to Africa packed their few belongings in their own coffins. Their coffins were their, what we call portmanteau in those days. You call them what now? Suitcases. They packed their few belongings in their own coffins, as in suitcases, before heading for the ship. Why? So that when they die, they will not be buried like the hidden but instead in their own coffins. Jesus made it abundantly clear that he who lost his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the sake of the gospel, we find it. John 12, 25 to 26, only dead men can do ministry. He who lost his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So only dead men do ministry. You have to die to insults. You have to die to what men will say against you, about you. You have to die to so many things to be able to survive while in ministry. At this juncture, let me explain the violence of these dead real men. The violence of these dead real men is not against their neighbors or their perceived enemies that they pray to fall and die. Their violence is against the works of the flesh in themselves. And we all have the works of the flesh. Their violence is against the flesh. Matthew 5, 27 to 30. Listen to Jesus. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her 
not, he didn't say to love her, to lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. That's the violence of real men. Pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. What is the meaning of this? It simply means surgery is better than tragedy. Say that with me. I can't hear you. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to 14. Surgery is better than tragedy. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run your race that you may lay hold of the prize and make it yours. Now every athlete who goes into training conducts himself temperately and restricts himself in all things. They do it to win a wreath that will soon wither. But we do it to receive a crown of eternal blessedness that cannot wither. Therefore, I do, run, I do not run uncertainly without definite aim. I do not box like one bit in the air and striking without an adversary. But like a boxer, I buffet my body. That is the violence. I buffet my body, handle it roughly, discipline it by hardships, and subdue it. For fear that after proclaiming to others the gospel and things pertaining to it, I myself should become unfit, not stand the test, be unapproved and rejected as counterfeit. Colossians chapter 3, 5 to 11. Colossians 3, 5 to 11. Therefore put to death. That's the violence. Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the rod of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourself are, put, are to put off all this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since we have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, non circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. C. Point C. Having gone through surgery, Real men are dead to sin and alive to God. If you go through that surgery, if you partake of that violence against filthiness, against flesh, against carnality, then you are dead to sin and alive to God. Romans 6, 8 to 14. Romans 6, 8 to 14. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the dead that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to what? To be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its laws. And do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead 
and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over me. Why don't you say amen before I say your own? Sin shall have no dominion over me. Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Can I hear amen? amen. Tell your neighbor, sin shall have no dominion over you. D, this surgery is not the mutilation of the flesh. So don't go tomorrow and cut off your hand and say, I'm a nan, I'm putty. No, it's not mutilation of the flesh. Write down Philippians 3, 1 to 16 in NIV and Colossians 2, 16 to 23. This is against false religion, false humility. Every, every time you put a burden upon yourself that, okay, I'm going to fast and pray till this flesh is dead. No, what you need is grace. What you need is understanding. What you need is the mastery of God to overcome those things. You can fast and pray for days and still end up on a prostitute. It's not mutilation of the flesh. Have you written down Philippians 3, 1 to 16? Take time to study it. Shall we read a little so that you understand what it is? Philippians 3, 1 to 16. For the, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, these evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For if it is, it is we who are the circumcision, we will serve God by spirit who boasts in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. That's what it means to die to the flesh. We have no confidence in the flesh. We do not trust willpower. New year what? Resolution. If there's no new you, there can be no new year. You can read the rest. You will see things that he counted but downed that he may win the excellence that is in Christ Jesus. This surgery is not the mutilation of the flesh. Rather, it's a prime byproduct of the doctrine you are delivered or entrusted. If you receive accurate doctrine, way of life, you discover that in no time you overcome those things you have tendency to fall into all the time. Romans 6, 15 to 18. The doctrine is simple. You die, you are raised with Christ, and you are seated with Christ in heavenly places at the right hand of God where there's no room for the devil. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you are slaves of sin, yet you obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. It's as simple as ABC. If the doctrine you listen to makes room for you to live anyhow because of grace, you will end up in lasciviousness. E. It is for this purpose that serious believers must allow the word of Christ to dwell in them richly so as to produce the character of the new man in them. Colossians 3, 12 to 17. I want you to read the heading for me. I'm rounding off now. Read the heading for me. Does it say the character of the new man? Colossians 3, 12 to 17. What does it say? The character of the new man. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on what? Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is a bond of perfection. 
and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Ready? Read. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Read loud and clear. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. The motto for real men is spelled out by Apostle Paul in Philippians 1.21. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Friends, real men do not fear death. They know they are dead already and their lives are hidden with Christ in God. Consequently, no one can kill real men. No witch, no wizard. And no sorcerer can eliminate them as long as they focus on things that are above and not on things which are on the earth. Colossians 3, 1 to 3. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. That's the level where there is no devil. If you still are afraid of witches, of voodoo, of babalao, of wizards, it simply means you are not dead yet. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ was on the cross, he was not dying on your behalf. He was dying as you. You were nailed with him on the cross. Therefore, you don't fear witches, you don't fear wizards. You know who you are in him. Can I hear amen? amen? Think for a moment about the three Hebrew boys thrown into the fiery furnace. I think I will come back to teach on this. To see the difference in their lives while they were not afraid. Oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Our God whom we serve will deliver us. But if not, we will still not bow. If you don't bow, you will not born. Because you know the stuff you are, that you are made up of. Do you understand me? Do you know what Nebuchadnezzar said? That how many men did we throw inside the fiery, fiery furnace? How many men? Do you realize that the hefty men in the army who threw them in died because of the flame, the intensity of the flame? The soldiers that threw them in died. But they counted one, two, three. And Nebuchadnezzar said, I see the fourth, of, the fourth man. He looks like the son of God. He, doesn't know, he didn't know his name. He said, this one looks like the son of God. But he could not call his name, so he called Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out of the fire. Next Sunday, we'll examine the decree he made. We'll go to Belteshazzar. We'll see what happened. Because these dead real men are violent against themselves, and they are ready to make God known to their generation. They come out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Good news for you. The fourth man is still waiting in the fire. He's waiting for you. Because you will pass through fire, you will go through all those things and make your God known to the world. Only dead men can do ministry. If you are not dead already, death will scare you and hold you in bondage for the rest of your life. But for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I've not finished point number one. I'll finish it next week. I'll we'll go to point number two till we get to real men. A gentleman. Can I hear? Amen.